When I was 15 years old, I contracted something called ringworm. Is anyone familiar with what ringworm is? Raise your hand. It's an awful thing. Um, it's, essentially, it's a skin rash that you get on your skin, and it's little red dots that go all over your skin, and it's incredibly itchy. It's annoyingly itchy, um, and there's no, there's no actual worms. I don't know why they call it ringworm. There's no worms, so it's not as gross as it sounds. The only reason I think they would call it ringworm is to scare 15-year-old kids like me and to make me have no friends growing up. That's, that's the only reason why I can think of why they call it ringworm. But it's a rash that gets on your skin, and it's very uncomfortable, and I had it for a period of time of six months. I couldn't get rid of it. It just kept coming, and every day I would find another spot on me, and it was super itchy and uncomfortable. I got a spot on my head one time, and my hair started balding from this place that it was coming out. I had tons of friends growing up, as you can probably tell. Uh, but I, I, I couldn't get rid of it, and it was super itchy, super uncomfortable, a period of six months. But the worst part about ringworm is that it's highly contagious, that you, you, if you touch it, you could very easily get it yourself. So me being a 15-year-old kid, I had to stay away from the things that I loved doing the most all the time. So any sports, physical activity that I did, I had to stay away from people. I couldn't let them touch me or get too close to them because I could give them ringworm too. So here I am with spots all over me. I had to take this special medicine and a balding spot in my head and I'm itching like I'm some crazy person. And, and I, I had it for six months and I couldn't get rid of it. And there's no worse feeling than that, especially as a teenager, uh, than feeling like this pastor alluded to this idea earlier, but this outsider feeling, this feeling as if, as if you don't belong or as if somebody, there's something wrong with you and you're looking from the outside in. And it was a terrible, terrible experience. Um, and we're looking at a story of a man who has a skin disease. Now, I will be honest, this is a much worse skin disease than the one that I had. But he has this skin disease and this, this disease that he has comes into tension with his relationship with God. And he comes into this crossroad where this story brings up this tension and question where the man is asking himself, but where we also now have to ask ourselves, am I an outsider to God? Is there room for me in the story of God? So we're going to look at this story. But in order to fully understand the context and everything that is happening here, we're going to slow down. And we're going to unpack everything that's happening here and the deep hurt and pain and confusion that this man could be feeling and probably is feeling in this moment. So we're going to do something. We're going to read the first part of this passage. It's going to be a couple short verses. And then we're going to take some time to slow down and we're going to unpack the context of what's happening so we can understand fully why this man could be so upset. And at the end, we're going to finish the passage to see how Jesus resolves it. Does that make sense? Give me a thumbs up if you're with me here. Cool. We're all in this together, so if it goes bad, we all take blame. Cool? Cool. So here's what's happening. Jesus just finished something called the Sermon on the Mount. It is the most famous sermon he's ever given, and it, it takes, of course, over three different chapters in Matthew, and is this introduction and explanation of what the kingdom of God is going to be like. And Jesus comes to earth as God and man, fully in one. He says, the kingdom of heaven is here, and then the Sermon on the Mount, he's explaining what it's going to look like. And he's up on this mountain explaining to the people what the kingdom of heaven is like. And just like, just like we see Moses coming down from the mountain, giving the law of God to the people of Israel, we are to see Jesus in the same way, where he's coming from this mountain, giving the law to his people of this new kingdom, this new kingdom of heaven that is to come and that he declares is here, here and now. So this is the context. So he finishes this part and he finishes this, this sermon, if you will, and he moves from talking about ideals and hypotheticals of what the kingdom of God is like. And now he moves into action where he's displaying what the kingdom of God would look like in action. If regular everyday people were to come in contact with the kingdom of God, what would it look like? And in typical Jesus fashion, he starts displaying miracles. And this is where we pick up. This is found in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. And a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. If you are willing, you can make me clean. We're going to pause there. 
So Jesus leaves this mountain. He says he comes down from the mountain. And as he comes down from this mountain, this man comes towards him. It's like this collision course that's coming together here. And we're trying to figure out how is Jesus going to respond to this? And he comes to Jesus after this incredible sermon. And he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And it says he has a leprosy, which could be interpreted as many different skin diseases that he could have. Similar, but way more significant than my ringworm. And he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean, which is an interesting thought. Because this is not how I would have asked this question. Because he doesn't, he doesn't say, Lord, if you are able to, if you are capable of making me clean, you will do it. For one reason or another, this man recognizes that Jesus has the ability to make him clean. He does not doubt the power and the capacity of Jesus to do it. But he is doubting whether or not Jesus is willing. He's in a sense doubting Jesus's character. He knows he can, but he's not sure if he's willing. So he comes before him and says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Are you willing to make me clean from the disease that has altered my entire life? Are you willing to make me clean from the obstacle that has prevented me from being around the people I love? Are you willing to resolve this for me? He's questioning Jesus' character. But he also says something else really weird. He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean clean. Once again, it's not how I would have asked it. I would have asked Jesus, if you are willing, you can heal me, right? To me, that seems more important. Like I would rather be healed than clean. Or is this, is this really not that big of a deal? Why did he say clean as opposed to heal? And I think what he, this man is referring to the fact that he has been deemed ceremonially unclean. Say that 10 times fast. Ceremonially unclean. And if this is true, this has some major ramifications for his life. If he was deemed unclean by the Jewish leaders of his day, it would have some major implications. He would literally become an outsider where he would be an outsider both socially. He could, he could not be around the people he loved because he could then give them this disease and they would become unclean. So he would be forced away from the people he loved and knew. But he also would be, un, or he would also be an outsider spiritually where he could not enter into places of worship because he could give this disease to other people and they could be unclean too. And he could not enter inside of the temple in the presence of God with this disease that made him unclean. This was a big deal for him. So here's Jesus and he's saying, I'm coming here. I'm bringing the kingdom of heaven down. And this man essentially is looking before Jesus and he asked him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Can I be a part of this kingdom too? Or am I still going to be an outsider here? Can I be a part of everything you just described or am I still the outsider? So this is a big deal. And I want to take a moment to take you all on a journey. And I, I will put this disclaimer out here that it may seem like we're going down a rabbit trail that makes no sense, but bear with me. This is crucially important. I want to understand the deep, significant pain that this man might be feeling in this moment. So in order to do that, I want to look at the context of this specifically in the terms of the temple because he was excluded from the temple because of this disease that made him unclean. So you guys ready? We're going on a journey. So here he goes. God's entire plan throughout all of the Bible, it can be summed up in this. His entire purpose is to bring back in communion heaven and earth. To bring God's presence back to earth, back into communion, back into relationship with the creation and the people that he loves. It's his entire purpose, his entire plan that heaven would one day be brought back just like it was in the Garden of Eden and before it was separated through our mistakes and through our sin. So that is God's plan throughout the, the entirety of the Bible, his whole restoration process. But, and he started this, this process with something called the temple. And it started off as a tent that literally sat in the middle of the Israelite camp and it eventually evolved into this magnificent, beautiful building that is called the temple. And God's presence literally resided inside of the temple. 
where the Israelite nation and God's people could come before inside the temple and they could meet with God. They could be in the presence of God. They could gain wisdom. They could worship in the presence of God. This temple was viewed almost as if it's this portal to heaven right in the middle of earth where you could access heaven right here where the presence of God was. But the problem is this, is that if you were deemed unclean, you were unable to access the temple. You could not be in the presence of God and worship God fully if you were unclean. It wasn't allowed. And this is significant because, because of course, there, there were things that you could do. There's sacrifices and bathing rituals that you could do in order to, to rectify those things. But, but if the disease persisted, you for years, maybe your entire life, would not be able to access the presence of God. I don't know about you, that seems a little unfair. <laughs> because we have to remember, being unclean, it, it doesn't mean that there's something morally wrong about you. It's not because you've done anything morally wrong. It just means that you have a disease that you can't help, and now that restricts you from accessing God's presence. Why? Why? And we have to remember this. God is good and perfect, and he is the author of life. The author of life, the source of all goodness and all of life. And anything that resembles death, anything that resembles brokenness and gives us a picture of that the world is not the way in which it should be, anything that resembles this death like something like a disease cannot be brought into the presence of God. It is incompatible with the author of life. You cannot bring something that resembles death into the presence of the author of life. They're not compatible with each other. And this may seem like archaic, this might seem like that's a really weird thing. That seems really weird. But I actually think we understand this better than we think. I think we get this idea. And this is an analogy I heard from a Dr. Tim Mackey about the temple specifically. And let me ask you this question. It's like this. How many of you guys, raise your hand, have been to a hospital before? Cool. We've all been there for various reasons in our life. We've been to the hospital for good or bad. Uh, we've all been familiar, unfortunately, with something called the hospital. However, there is a specific room inside of a hospital that most people will never, ever access, and only on very rare and very specific occasions, and it's called the operation room. Only select people can enter that room and only for a specific reason at a specific time. And here's one thing that's true about an operation room. You cannot go into the operation room with a cold. If you got a runny nose, you can't go out there opening somebody up with your runny nose all over the place. You can't go in there with mud on your shoes. You can't go in there without wearing gloves and a mask and a whole get up and everything. You cannot enter into this operation room without becoming clean first. Because if you did and you came in with bacteria and germs and all of this junk, you could potentially hurt the patient, right? It is incompatible. So here, this, this operation room, it's this holy space, if you will, this sacred location where you cannot enter this space without becoming clean first. We get this idea. This is not a revolutionary idea. And the same is true of God. He is this author of life, this sacred, this holy space. And you cannot bring death. You cannot bring sin inside of this holy space because they are incompatible. It will do damage. We get this idea. This is not revolutionary for us. But I think oftentimes we think that the reason that that's true is because we will contaminate God in some way. We have this idea that I cannot come before God with my sin because God cannot tolerate me as sinful. We believe that God cannot tolerate us as sinful people. So usually what this looks like practically is that we will avoid relationship with God until we feel morally superior enough to come before God. We will disengage in prayer and worship and scripture. We will disengage in relationship with God until we feel better about ourselves because we have this idea that I can't come before God in, in worship. I can't come before God because I will contaminate him somehow and he cannot tolerate me in his presence. This is the idea that we have about God. 
And I think this could be what this man might be feeling in this moment when he comes for Jesus. And I actually don't think this is true. And I wanna show you why. There's a story of a man, his name is Isaiah, he's a prophet. And Isaiah has this vision where he comes and he meets before and into the temple, into the presence of God. And a really significant thing happens. So I'm gonna look at this passage, it's gonna be on your screen. It's Isaiah chapter six, starting in verse one. It says this. And the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So he has this big grand vision, and him and God are inside the temple. Above him were seraphim, each throne, and each um, seraphim with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty." Then one of the seraphim flew to me with the live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs of the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips and your guilt has taken away and your sin atoned for. We usually hear this passage, if this is new for you, or if you're familiar with it, we sometimes hear this passage of, this is a beautiful thing, intimacy with God, right? Like we get to be in the presence of God, but Isaiah does not see this as good news. He has this vision that he is inside the temple with the presence of God and he immediately recognizes, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm unclean. I cannot be in God's presence right now. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. So then the doors start to shake. The whole foundation starts to tremble. Smoke fills the whole building and he's terrified. He screams out, woe is me, I'm ruined. This is the end of me. This is the end of the prophet Isaiah. I'm done, this is it. Send my will, tell my kids I love them. I'm gone, I'm over. He thinks he's gonna die. And then this terrifying, creepy angel with like 17 wings and four faces comes towards him and he's got a hot flaming coal in his hand. And he's like, he's gonna burn me away. This is what I get for being in the presence of God while being unclean. And this cold that Isaiah thought was going to consume him purifies him. And it makes him clean. The reason which death cannot be in the presence of God is not because God cannot tolerate it. It's not because God is afraid of it. It's not because we can contaminate God in any way. It's because we can't handle it. There is something incompatible that when we are presented to the author and the true good source of life, one of two things is gonna give and it's not us. We cannot handle being in his presence, but the story shows us something else. The story shows us that it is not our uncleanliness, it is not our sin that contaminates God, but it is God's holiness that contaminated Isaiah. God's goodness is more contagious than your darkness. God's goodness is more contagious than your darkness is more contagious than your sin, than your uncleanliness, than your guilt, than your shame. It is more contagious. So here's this man who now comes before Jesus. And for however long in his life, he has been told that he cannot access the presence of God. He cannot go to the temple to worship the way that everyone else does. And here Jesus comes and he comes up and he's having this big old party up on this mountain, uh, sharing to everyone. He says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The presence of God will no longer be restricted to a temple or a building. The presence of God will no longer be restricted just to the people of Israel that is open and it is available to everyone and it's spreading and here it comes. And we all say, hallelujah, right? Like that's amazing news. That is really good news that God is coming forward. His kingdom is spreading and here it is in the earth. But what if you view yourself as unclean? clean because then it's not so good news anymore 
What if you're a sinner? What if you view yourself as unlovable? Because you can't be in the presence of God. And now we just got told that the presence of God is expanding. So here's this man who comes before Jesus and he's unclean. He cannot enter the temple. He says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean because he knows, he recognizes, he sees, I can't be in the presence of God. And Jesus, you just told me that the presence of God is expanding. I'm done for. This is not good news for him. So what does Jesus do? We're gonna return to the story in verse three. He says this. Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. He said, I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that was commanded as a testimony to him. Every reason, every rationale that can come through our mind would tell us, Jesus, do not approach this man. He will make you unclean. You are too important. You are too good. You are too righteous. Do not approach this man. And I want to zoom in to the deep level of care and compassion that Jesus shows where he reaches out and touches a man who is probably devoid of human touch for Lord knows how long. And he grabs them. Every wave of logic in our brain tells us that Jesus has now become unclean. He now holds this disease. But the opposite, as it so often is in the kingdom of God, is true. That instead of Jesus becoming unclean, Jesus' holiness transfers to the man. Why? Because God's goodness is more contagious in our darkness. God's goodness is more contagious than our darkness. So the man walks away clean. Later in his ministry, Jesus would go to a cross and he would sacrifice and give himself up on a cross to give his life as a final sacrifice to the temple. That he would die and this would cover all all of life, that if you believe in the name of Jesus, you can be made clean. That if you follow Jesus and say, I believe and I trust in you, you also can be made clean. Can I tell you that there is a place for you in the kingdom of God? You do not have to be an outsider to God. And through the sacrifice of Jesus and what he gives, we have access to the presence of God. Amen? So I'm gonna call the worship team out. And what do we do with this information? And I think there's two things. Number one is this. You no longer have to hide from God. You no longer have to be in a position where you feel like you have to be good enough or morally superior enough before you can approach God or at least cancel out the bad things that you've done for a week or so until you can feel better about yourself before you start entering relationship with God. You no longer have to run from God. God is not terrified of our sin. He he can tolerate your sin. And I think the person of Jesus proves that he's not terrified. Let's not get it twisted. He's not about sin. He think it hurts, it hurts him, it hurts you, it hurts the people around you. But the person of Jesus proves that he's not afraid of you. And he's not afraid of being in close proximity to you. And he invites you in and invites you into a changing relationship with him. You no longer have to hide from God. That's number one. Number two is this. Jesus invites us into the mission of expanding his kingdom. Jesus invites us into the mission of expanding his kingdom. At the end of chapter seven, Pastor made allude to it at last week's message, uh, but it said that the crowds heard Jesus speaking and they were amazed and they said, this man has authority like anyone, like no one else we have ever seen. And they knew that there was something different about this Jesus, that he had some kind of authority that wasn't like the rest of the teachers. I think it's one of the reasons why this man felt comfortable enough going to Jesus where he knelt down and that word knelt means that he literally worshiped Jesus. He knew there was something different 
doctrine about Jesus because he had this authority. And all the way to the end of Matthew at chapter 28, right before Jesus is about to go, he tells his disciples, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. The same authority that we see in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, all of it has been given to me. And he says, go, make disciples, baptizing them in my name, expanding the kingdom of heaven to let you know, to let your friends know, to let your coworkers know, to let your family members know that the kingdom of God is expanding and there's room for you in it. There's room for you in the kingdom of God and he pursues you. He's not scared of you. So number one, don't have to hide from God. And number two, let's join in on this mission of expanding his kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we know that oftentimes we are ashamed of who we are, ashamed of what we have become. But Lord, we know that you have pursued us. You are not intimidated by our, our sin. You are not intimidated by our uncleanliness. And Lord, we know that through you, we can be made clean. It is too good of news to refuse that we have access to the kingdom of God. We praise you, Jesus, in your name, amen. Let's stand and we're gonna close out in worship today.